Hi, I'm Ed Frawley. Today we're at uh, we're here at Learburg with our friend Mark Keating. We thought it would be interesting, and we're going to do this with uh, all of the people that we do training DVDs with. We thought it would be interesting to sit down and talk with Mark. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't know Mark Keating. They don't know what his experience is. Uh, we're pretty selective in who we choose to do DVDs with. We there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of dog trainers out there. There's a lot of good dog trainers out there. Uh, we try and pick people that we like, that we get along with, that have a lot of integrity, have good experience, that are good dog trainers. And I just think that our customers would like to know a little bit more about the people. I think it just makes it more interesting. So we're just going to talk to, to Mark and, and kind of fill in a little bit of his background. Uh, I think to start off with, why don't you tell why don't you tell people what Red Star is all about and what you do for a living? Okay. Uh, first, it's great to be here. It's really great to be here. Um, Red Star is where I work. It's where I live. Red Star Kennel in Hudson, Wisconsin. We have uh, a boarding and training kennel where we primarily train pet dogs. We also breed three different breeds of dogs. We breed Presa Canarios, Belgian Malinois, and miniature poodles. And uh, you know, aside from boarding and training and training local dogs, we also compete in French Ring and train a few dogs locally in French Ring and help out some friends with some Mondial Ring training. And we, again, primarily do boarding and training, group classes, things like that. Uh, we do grooming. We're basically a, a, an all-in-one kind of dog spot. So that's where we work and, uh, yeah, that's... So tell us a little bit about some of the dogs you've trained and... Uh you know, you've been a decoy and in trials. Tell us a little bit about that, your history there. Sure. Uh, I got in French Ring and I started training in 2003. I became certified in 2004. At that time, I uh, was training uh, between my girlfriend Irina and I. We were training two dogs, a Dutch Shepherd, German Shepherd mix, and a Pressa. And we titled both of those dogs to a Ring 1. Really? So that was kind of cool. It was the first Pressa in the world to get a Ring 1. Mm. And uh, after that, I started working with some some other goofy dogs, rare goofy dogs, I say rare breeds, strange breeds, uh, in relation to the sport. Uh, I have uh, coached and, and done the biting work on a Bouvier female that, we, that reached ring two, which was the first one in the US, pretty cool. Uh, I've uh, put two brevets on Renaissance Bulldogs, which was tricky, <laughs> and uh, another Pressa. Uh, Irina and I together, I have a, a dog that I trained obedience and biting myself, who is ring three, quite a few times over. French ring. French ring three. Yeah. Irina uh, has a dog, had a dog uh, named Victory that was also French ring three that we, that we trained from the ground up. We bred those two dogs together and we have a dog now named Danger Mouse. And he is uh, completed ring two and now he's going to be in ring three this year. Uh, from a decoying perspective, I've decoyed, um, the last time I counted I thought I was at 34 trials. So uh, 34 trials under many, many judges, many French judges, which was always interesting. And, and uh, honestly, I learned a whole lot about dog training from decoying because, you know, not only I'm in there working against the team, but I saw while I was there and, you're, you know, you're at a trial a lot. So I would see things that would happen in obedience and jumping and, and biting. And I would say, oh, I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to go home and train to make sure that never happens to my dog. So it was very beneficial. In 2007, I competed uh, in the uh, North American Super Selection, which is where they take the, the decoys at the time. It was, and I believe it is still from anywhere, anyone can, it's open. So you can come from the US or Canada or Mexico or, or France. This is a decoy competition. It's a decoy competition. Okay. So you pick, a do you go in with a dog, you have to do a certain set of physical exercises, which are ridiculous and un just very, very grueling. Uh, but then at that time, you finish that and then you have to take a, a, a written exam and then you have to go do the work with the dog, which they call the practical work. Uh, and the dog that I used, I didn't realize when I went in, but guys that were bringing their own dog would bring a dog that they knew real well that was relatively easy. And I thought, at the time, I need to bring a strong dog that's 
you know, going to show that I can handle a strong dog, so I decided to use Jackson, Donna's dog. Donna Mady's dog. Which was, you know, and, I, and of course you're using <laughs> a, 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 a trial suit, yeah. which is literally like a set of card hearts, so yeah. I was limping for many, many days after that. <laughs> but, so I did that and It I makes actually, you move fast. Well, you, <laughs> fear makes you move yeah. very fast, very, very fast. Um, but that was 2007 and I won out of the American decoys, I, uh, there was two French, a French guy and a, a Mexican guy, uh, both really good decoys that I came behind. And uh, that was pretty cool. I, I felt pretty nice about that. And since then, I've just been pouring most of my time into training and training with people, helping out different teams, and then developing our dogs. Yeah, well, you're helping some local guys here, yeah. my son included, yeah. uh, learning how to be decoys. But yeah. You know, there's some young guys that are coming to train with you too on yes. Saturdays, on the weekends. Yeah, that's a relatively, this, this whole thing of, of teaching people to decoy, like you said, it's, it's weird because I can't really, sometimes I can't explain what I'm doing. I really can't. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just feeling what to do and it's happening. Mm -hmm. It's not always right, you know, correct. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so this is something new for me, uh, you know, starting with the DVDs and then working with, I've worked with Jeff on a few occasions and, and some other guys. And then now I have two young guys. Uh, they're both 16. Cool. Yeah. One guy's a hockey player and he's, cool. you know, big tall guy. And the other guy's, uh, he's a pretty sporty little guy too. And it's really, really fascinating because I would, at some point I would like someone who knows you know what I know to see these guys work because these guys you know bless them they have no idea what they're doing and a good attitude oh they have a wonderful attitude yeah. but they don't know why they're massaging the dog this way they don't know why they're using the stick this way they don't know why they're making these escapes or presentations they're just doing it because I'm telling them to and it's cool now because they're doing it second nature now yeah. so now I don't tell them anymore and they know how to pet and how to reinforce and uh, you know Working with Jeff is a little different because Jeff is, um, he has a lot more access to a lot more dog training information, complicated information, and Jeff is, is pretty astute. So he picks up on all these things by, you know. Well, I think it's cool you're working with these young guys because if we don't train young people, what's going to happen? Yeah. It can't be us 65, and I know you're approaching 55. <laughs> Couple more next year. Next year. Uh, but we have to train the young people. It's true. It's if true. we don't train train young people, the sport's gonna gonna die. And yeah. and what's nice about training the young people is they don't develop the egos as quickly as th that's a big problem in the in the decoy world. It is. It's huge. And it and it's the thing is it's it's kind of like you know people make a lot of guitar player jokes. You know how many guitar players does it take to screw in a light bulb? Five. One to do it, and four to tell them how they do it better. And that you know? yeah. <laughs> so it's it's kind of the same thing where. With dog it, but it, it is because and, and a big part of it is because it is so artistic. It is so creative. It is so personal. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, it's kind of like there's no. There really is, I mean, there's not really a correct, you can't say there's a correct Absolutely. way because you have a different guy, a different, or, or woman, and you have a different handler and a mm -hmm. different dog, and the, the parameters are always going to be shifted a little bit, so you need to be, you know, open. Um, well, the same thing's going on with, really with dog training since the advent of what we call reward-based training, yeah, marker training, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. there is no perfect way. Mm -hmm. You know, the way you use uh, clickers or markers is, is a little bit different than the way Cindy uses them or the way that I use them. But most certainly it doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong, what we're doing is wrong. It's just a little different way, but it's all under the same system. The concepts are the same. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, like I use the example of using a clicker. Uh, you'll use a clicker, I think, if I'm, if I'm correct as a uh, continuation, exactly. yeah. you know, and then we'll use uh, the clicker as, as the final. As a release, basically. The final release, release. right. You know, but that doesn't matter as long as we're consistent. Mm -hmm. The beauty of it all is we're not beating dogs up the way we used to with prong collars. And it's stuff. fair. It's just great. It's yeah. just the people that are starting training today, whether it be uh, in obedience training and in, in any dog sport using motivational methods, 
is light years ahead. Yeah. And you're doing the same thing with these young guys. That's the cool thing yeah. about it. And you know, it's, there's a lot of people now that, um, th there's, a, there's a strong opinion here in the U.S. that we will never, at least in terms of the, some of these biting sports, when we talk Shih Tzu, we talk Mondio Ring, we talk French Ring, there's a lot of people that think that we just don't have the potential to compete with the guys in Europe. Ha! So yeah, it's right. a very, it's a, you know, I mean, we can kind of laugh about it because we know of some of these, I mean, some of the methods that we're using here are brilliant. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of Europeans that are way, way behind in that. There's a lot of Europeans that are also using some of the same methods right. with clickers and electric collars and things like that. But uh, in terms of that, I, I did want to say this because it's important. This stuff is difficult, biting stuff, for many, many reasons. A, equipment is expensive. Mm -hmm. Good dogs are expensive. Okay, now we have to travel to the field, that's expensive. If we're getting into competitions, you have to travel to competitions, hotel rooms, entry fees. Yeah. All this stuff is expensive. And when I'm, from, from a French ring pers perspective, or even from, uh, from a Mondial ring perspective, if I want to go to a Mondial ring trial, there might be one trial in my area a year. If I want to go to another trial, I have to drive to Texas, yeah. or I have to drive to Ohio. And the thing is, in Europe, if I drive to Texas, and I start in France, I'm more or less in like Turkey or something like that. <laughs> yeah. By the time I, you know, if, if no, we're I know. at the same distance. So our geography is a huge hindrance to us in general with these things. That is another reason why what you're doing is so priceless because people don't have to drive across the country and spend three weeks at a school or somewhere. And, and you know, while that experience is invaluable, it's very, it's pricey. Well, you can be in Germany and you can drive 30 miles in Germany and you're gonna drive by 40, 40 Schutzen clubs. Exactly. You know, exactly. and you know, I, you talk about how the Europeans don't think that uh, we can beat them. I remember that was the yeah. attitude back in the 80s. I will say a real, real quick disclaimer. What I'm saying is not in this particular case the Europeans, but it's some of the Americans who believe that the Europeans, that we'll never be able to touch the Europeans. Well, they're wrong. You know, they thought that, and I remember look at the late 80s, early 90s when the American team went over there and in Schutzen now, mm -hmm. and kicked butt. Yeah, they did well. Really did. Where I mean, I was in, I was in, where was I? I was in Germany in 1982 and saw the level of dogs that we took then mm -hmm. and saw the dirty tricks that the Germans played then on us. I remember being with a friend of mine uh, who had a Schutzen 3 dog that V-rated. That means he scored 95 or higher out of 100 in his previous 20 Schutzen tracks. And when we got out to the field, and I digress here a little bit, but we got out to the field and he was supposed to track sixth. Well, they had him track second because the guys that were running the thing saw, oh geez, look at our tracking field at the top of the hill. There's a farmer cutting the field. Well, a dog can't track through fresh cut grass. Sure, sure. So they put him on that track. We were too stupid to realize that we need to stand up and say, no, this is wrong. We're not going to do it. And he failed. He failed. Oh, that second dog, the dog numbered. Oh, no. My that... friend's dog failed. Had he gone six, he would have been over here on another track mm -hmm. and he would have V rated mm -hmm. and it cost him the track. But Americans have learned we can beat anybody. And, and also we have, we have, you know, we might not have the amount of Mondial ring trials or French ring trials or Schutzen trials, but what we have here, I believe, is brilliant dog training. Yes. You know, in, in terms of... Uh, hard working trainers. Hard, and these trainers, they are dog trainers, yeah. which, which is very cool for me. They're, uh, and and they're not, they don't just limit themselves to Schutzen, or to, at least the way that I look at it, for me, I love everything. That, that anything you can get a dog to do that's done in a fair way, you know, where it's fair to the dog and fair to everyone around. I love it all. Anything yeah. they're doing. I, uh, any kind of dog training I think is wonderful. And a lot of the things that I'm doing right now in French ring, if Fr I think if French people from France saw me doing it, they would shake their head and probably throw something at me. They'd think, <laughs> this guy's a goofball. What is he doing with that clicker? Why is he doing that? It's blah, blah, blah. But all of these things, um, I've stumbled on or I've seen other people in the U.S. using in different applications. And there are people in Europe, of course, agility is huge, They're you know, and obedience and yeah. stuff. There are people that are doing all these things. It's just, 
and, and I believe even Michael Ellis has spoke about this to some degree, what, what's happening now is in biting sports, for some reason, biting sports are like at the caboose of this motivational train. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you've got all these people in obedience, agility, probably, you know, tracking I know nothing about, so I can't really say anything about that, but you have all these people that are using these methods. And in biting sports, we were still kind of lost in this yank and crank stone age thing where, and I think part of it's probably because you're dealing with such heightened states of drive, basically. It is, know? but it's all changing, you know. Oh, yeah. It's, the, no, it's, it's oh, how yeah. to play tug with your dogs. Now, you know, we've done a number of DVDs on how to play tug with dogs, and a lot of the agility people are now having, you bring up Michael, mm -hmm or having Michael come and do seminars with him because playing tug with a dog is all of a sudden they've realized the value to it and they realize most importantly the dogs like it. The dogs that do like it, it's, it's their drive motivation and the way they were using it is wrong. Well, it's not wrong, yeah, yeah. but it's not as good as what the biting sports people yeah. use because the biting sports people have, have brought it to a level that is, well, it's Perfect. Through the know. interaction, what can happen is through the biting stuff is you can actually, under certain circumstances, you can develop something more than is there genetically. Exactly. So and you can teach a dog to be stronger. It's the most personal way, really, of interacting, of interacting with your dog. Mm -hmm. It really is. I think agility people were probably, you know, if I could just, you know, take a, take a stab at it, were probably using it as just like a way of rewarding, basically. Like, oh, here's your tug. Yeah. Take it, play with it, have a good time. Instead of learning how to actually interact with the dog while tugging, it becomes so much more valuable to the dog. And especially something like agility, where agility is very difficult work. The dog has to be in a super high state of drive and also has to be relatively clear. In what they're doing. Yeah, because they can, you know. Well, the old school, you know, the old school was don't ever play tug with your dog because he's going to kill you in your, in your, in your sleep. <laughs> Yeah. When you're not looking, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, and you know, yeah, and that's just so yeah, but, so outdated yeah. that. Uh, yeah, but you know, you someone know. actually said to me just recently. I mean, you know, I get the same stuff that you do. Where, you know, maybe ten or fifteen percent of the my work stuff is biting stuff. Mm -hmm. A woman the other day, I was telling her how beneficial it is to feed a raw diet. And she said, but won't that make them mean? Yeah. Literally. And oh, she was completely I know. serious that she thought that by feeding a dog raw meat, yeah. by e eating meat, tasting blood, it would make it mean. Yeah, it wouldn't make them sick, too. Yeah. It's oh, going to make yeah. them sick because it's not cooked, you know? Yeah. yeah, that's why we have all these wolves and foxes dying in the woods because yeah. they eat two day old dead deer. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, luckily for us, there's science. To yeah. The, to and people with common sense. Yeah. You know. you know, all this motivation, Pavlov's dog, it all comes yeah. from Pavlov's dog, which is, you know, and it's really the, uh, we could go on and on and on about this stuff, and it's always great talking to you, but the, uh, the wonderful thing, at least all the things that I've come up with, which are all the things, maybe the four or five things that I've come up with on my own, which that's even, that's even a stretch. But everything that I have come, come up with, not learned directly from someone else, has been a complete accident. Yep. Nothing was premeditated. Nothing was, I never thought about it. And, thought, and oh, that's the thing about making, make, doing what we do and making DVDs. We don't think this stuff up. <laughs> we don't think it up. No, no, it's out there. We steal ideas from other smart people mm -hmm. and try and put it together. That's been the story of my life. Going to seminars, learning from new people. Uh, I only wish that... 35 years ago, I would have had access to somebody like you. All the people back then came from Europe. Mm -hmm. We'd go to seminars. We, they couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. Somebody would ask a question. They'd have a translator there. We'd ask a question. The instructor would talk in German or French mm -hmm. for five minutes, mm -hmm. and the translator would answer it in two seconds. <laughs> that yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What did he say? Oh, yeah, Come on. <laughs> <laughs> because they didn't under, they'd get a translator that didn't understand dog terminology. Yeah. It wasn't, they weren't trying to be mean about it. That's just the story. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, how we got involved with Mark is uh, Cindy competes in the Mondial Ring. And uh, Cindy has worked with Mark for a few years in Mondial. And the more we worked with him, the more we liked him. But. Back to, the, back to the breeding aspect, I, I think it'd be interesting. What about this poodle thing? How'd you get started with those? Because when I first heard about it, uh, I laughed a little bit, but then I met Mark's poodles, 
and I had no idea that poodles could be such cool dogs. They're so cool that one of our employees, uh, uh, a college student that works in our, art, our IT department, we just talked him into buying one of these little poodles. So we have, uh, we have one of Mark's poodles in the office every day now, and it's the coolest little dog, I'm telling you. Uh, but why don't you tell us, how'd you get involved in poodles? Sure, well, I grew up, <clears throat> I grew up in a family that was kind of really active with dogs. We had dogs all the time, and we actually had toy poodles and miniature poodles growing up. Yeah. So, and I really liked them. They were great to have around. They were really useful. Uh, they really enjoyed being with us. They always seemed like they were up for whatever we wanted to do. So as I got older, uh, when I got my first dog to, to do things with, to try and train, I was 19. And that was in 1996. And uh, that was a mixed dog and <clears throat> started to learn about training, learn about bite work, see all the things that were out there, started to see some, some Learberg videos and uh, realized that wanted more. So then eventually I got into the working sports and bite work and all those kinds of things. And uh, as I got a little bit older, I realized that I needed to think about the future and I should look into another breed of dog that I can work with and continue to handle and, and enjoy. Uh, later into my years, so I looked into miniature poodles, and what was the shock was, you know, when I had my poodles growing up, I didn't really know what I know now. And when I uh, started talking with the show people, which is not my thing at all, once I started talking to the show people about the miniature poodles specifically, it's a very uh, manipulated breed. They did a lot to manipulate the genetics in the miniature poodle to get the hair, to, to get the size and things like that. So the breeders are very astute when it comes to lines, genetics, health, all these things. And on top of it, what they want in a miniature poodle, these show breeders, believe it or not, is a really bold, strong, good character dog. That's what I see. I mean, I'm amazed. Here I bred uh, German Shepherds for almost 35 years. And I did not have any idea that a poodle could have the kind of drive and the kind of temperament uh, that they do have. And when I first heard you were breeding poodles, I kind of laughed at it, but then now that I see them, and a year ago, uh, Cindy and I rescued a 10-year-old Shih Tzu mm -hmm. as the first small dog I ever had. Mm -hmm. And once I fell in love with her, I never let a dog sleep in my bed ever mm -hmm. until this dog. Mm -hmm. And once I fell in love with her, she sleeps in our bed and I see what you see in a small dog. They're cool little dogs. Mm -hmm. And I bred uh, German imported German Shepherds from Germany for police work and working dogs and search and rescue. Mm -hmm. So I was always used to, like you, the press is the big, strong dogs, and we get these little dogs, and they're just cooler than snot. Mm -hmm. So uh, where did you start to go to get your training? How did that all evolve? Uh, dog training. I started at Red Star. Okay. I, uh, I, my girlfriend, Irina, I met her, and <clears throat> she kind of got me into it, you know, gave me access to dogs to work. I learned about bite work there. I started primarily working protection dogs and security-type dogs, and actually... Uh, I, I would say I probably worked a hundred dogs before I ever worked a Malinois. Really? Yeah. Oh. So when I finally did start to work a Malinois, you know, obviously they, they bring a lot of energy and it's, it's much easier to work them. So, you know, being the lazy guy I am, I kind of started to drift that way. So like uh, you, were, you were talking about how you breed, how many litters a year are you breeding? Of Malinois? Or, well, or all three. I think it's interesting. We, uh, we have about one litter a year of each breed. So and you're not a huge no, no. We breed puppy for, mill type of a deal. No, if we breed, we breed for ourselves. Yeah. I will have a litter of Malamas because I want to keep something for myself because I'm ready for another dog. Or uh, the Poodles will breed because we're trying to... The Poodles, it's a little bit different because we are kind of an ugly duckling in that world in the way that we're, our Poodles are bred for, for you know, show and they must be correct, all that kind of stuff. But our main priority is work and how well and how uh, able they are to do the work. So uh, with Poodles, we look at that. With our Pressas, uh, we have even less because the Pressas gene pool is so unbelievably shallow. It's very difficult to find a quality dog who has a quality temperament and quality health. So because of that, we only breed a litter of Pressas, I would say, on average once every year and a half, maybe even two years now. Mm. 
Yeah, so very little. And again, not, not to produce and produce and produce. It's all, it's, it's all motivated by selfish reasons. All yeah. Right. Well, I've seen, uh, you know, I've seen some of your Malinois and not some of your, your poodles. I've never seen the presses just because I've never been around when you had the puppies. Mm -hmm. I've seen pictures of them. They're cooler than snot. Mm -hmm. So then, now let's talk about uh, you got involved in the French ring sport, and how did that all come to pass? Well, in 1999, I saw, uh, I was looking at, I had an American Bulldog at the time, and I was looking into other breeds, because I knew that if I wanted to achieve what I wanted to achieve in terms of training, and I didn't, I wasn't looking at competition at all, I was just looking at learning and being able to teach a dog to do things, I realized I needed more dog. And I was looking into a breed called the Bolseron, which is a French shepherd type dog. A very cool dog, kind of like the evil Malinois. They're, yeah. they're kind of cool that way. Uh, and I was talking with a breeder and she had sent me a video of French ring from France. And up until this time, I had primarily seen, you know, some of your videos on Schutzen. I've seen some uh, personal protection stuff. It was all very cool, but when I saw French ring, what I saw was a completely different thing in the way that the, the guy in the suit was trying to get away from the dog biting him. And he was able to do a lot of really... He's smarter. They were smarter. Get away know, from that sucker. Funny because when you... The decoying thing is a very interesting thing because it's, there's not a lot of reward in terms of anything outside of your own self-satisfaction and it's extremely taxing on your body. That's so true. You, you get into French ring and you're like, okay, I get to move out of the way. I don't want him to bite me deep. We're always working for it. The decoy is truly opposed to the dog. And when I saw it, I, visually to me, it was, it was incredible. And then the jumps, you know, you've got big jumps and all this stuff. So I started to look into it and I found a, a fella in Chicago who, his name is Adrian Moreno, and he taught me basically a lot of the things that I know now about Ring, a good chunk of my foundation knowledge in Ring, I learned from this guy. Uh, very, very excellent decoy, excellent trial decoy, wonderful work, beautiful to watch. Where is he from? He's from Chicago. Okay. And he's still in the area, I believe. It, he doesn't train as much Ring anymore, but at the time he really, and, and I thank him a million times, he took me under his wing and really took time to, to bring me up and teach me. Uh, the reason I like Ring now, the reason I like bite sports is because I enjoy the interaction between me and the dog. When the dog is biting me, I enjoy building the dog, I enjoy teaching the dog control during the biting and doing these different exercises. Uh, but ring allows me creative freedom in the trial and in the training. Why Where, don't you expand on that? So okay, well in the way like, <clears throat> When I was young, I, I also play music, and when I was young, uh, my father told me, if you can play any style of music, you will always work. And I thought, okay, so I better learn how to play polka, and I better learn how to play jazz, and I better learn how to play hip hop, and country, and all these different things. And when you look at music, and you take a music like, say, jazz music, and I think everybody can understand that this, jazz music is sometimes very strange and very weird, because what you have is complete, creative freedom. Yeah. So what that means in a trial is in Mondial Ring you are not allowed to hit a dog with a stick. Yeah. Okay. You, uh, you have to do, you're not allowed to, you have to walk kind of a, a, a regular way in the escort. There are certain parameters that are not there in Ring. In Ring, as long as it's, there are parameters, but within those parameters there's all kinds of room to exploit either the dog's genetic or his training or uh, Basically, if he's slower, if he's faster, whatever it may be, if a dog's real fast, you can move out of the way in a second and he'll fly by you. If the dog's real slow, it gives you time to put up a nice big barrage. And you can adapt from dog to dog. You don't need to do the same thing from dog to dog, which is what a lot of other sports require. So that's why I prefer French ring. Well, I think um, I agree with you on what you're saying. I think just for the sake of people watching this that have no idea of what the biting sports are. I can't think of how many times over the years I would try and tell people what we do. Veterinarians, veterinarians are healthcare providers, they're not dog trainers, but 
it makes no difference. Friends that don't know dogs, and they'd say, why are you teaching a dog to bite? Why would you bite? teach your dog to bite? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And what I try and tell people is that every military police dog, every police dog comes from bloodlines that are generated in the biting dog sports. In sports. People mistakenly think that, well, police dogs come from police dogs. I personally don't know one police department that has a breeding program that's successful, not one anywhere. In fact, most police departments have policies that say you cannot breed that police dog. Well, they, they, don't they spay and neuter a, a lot of their A dogs? lot of them do. A lot of the police dogs, like in Europe, are what's called menorchids. They only have one testicle. Mm -hmm. So they'll take them through the training, and then when those dogs get to be two years old, they neuter them. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a strong genetic trait. You couldn't breed that dog. Sure, but People need to understand that aren't in the biting dog sports. They need to understand that search and rescue dogs, police dogs, military working dogs, dogs that you see with the TSA, they come from the biting dog sports because the people that are involved in the biting dog sports want to breed uh, workability. They want to breed drive. They want to breed temperament into their bloodlines. Uh, these dogs that are in the biting dog sports, if they show bad temperament on the field, they're excused from a trial. They have to pass a temperament test. But we digress. Yeah. Back, to, back to Mark Keating here. You brought up the, the subject of music, and I know uh, that you're a good musician, and I know because Cindy and I have gone and watched you on Saturday nights, mm -hmm. drink beer, watch Mark, have a good time. Uh, but how did you get involved in music? Your whole family, from what I understand, is involved in music. Yeah, grandparents, it goes on cool. both sides. I always say I was bred. I wasn't really produced. <laughs> it's true. I have a, my father is one of many children. They're all musicians. My mother's family, all musicians. I have five brothers. We are all musicians, and we're all, and you know, at the risk of sounding arrogant, we're all pretty good. But we grew up in a house that said, from four years old, you're playing piano. You must play piano every day. You have to practice piano. And um, it kind of went from there. When I was uh, in third grade, I started playing guitar a little bit. And I had to struggle with it quite a bit. And by the time I was 11, I started playing drums. And that was, um, and honestly, I can attribute at least 65, 70% of my success in dog training from playing the drums. Really? Yeah. And people Where does that, that come from? Says, How does that work? Timing. Oh. Timing. Timing in this, and I find that, uh, the risk of offending anyone, I find that musicians make some of the best dog trainers because of different reasons. First reason, timing. Okay, you understand timing and you develop, when you play music, any kind of music, you develop an internal clock. Did I tell you what a great singer I am? No, you did No, but that sounds like a, that sounds like a lovely section for, 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 I mean, there's got to be room for that here somewhere. Well, uh, later. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But, but when, anyway, when back back. how many different uh, instruments do you play? I play piano, bass, guitar, and drums. Wow. Yeah. I, I had, had no idea. Yeah, but uh, i probably uh, the best at the drums. Huh. And then guitar now. I've been playing guitar. I've been atta attacking the guitar really hard for about the last six years. I think I heard you say that. Now, explain what you mean by that, how you approach your learning well, in the guitar. Same bass. thing, the same way I approach the dogs. Same thing I do is I, I first of all, I find someone that inspires me, mm -hmm. that has taken whatever it is that I'm doing, much in the way that the same dog people, that the people that inspire me in, in, in dogs have taken it to another level. And I look for someone that, I, that appeals to me, that I like their music, that I like their approach to the instrument, and I study their ways. Who, do you, who stands out there? Pierre Ben Suzanne, who is a French guy of no coincidence, you know, it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that it's a French guy, but um, he he, he said something, and, and if, I could, if I could do a really bad job at quoting him, I think it's a beautiful thing to say to any person who is creative. And that is this. When you think, you don't understand. And when you are learning something, when you're learning how to do these, uh, if you're learning laterals and you're doing decoy work, or you're putting a dog on the shoulder, or you're doing a pivot upper body, you have to think and think and learn. And at the moment when it comes time to do, you have to completely clear your mind. Because if you think, it will not happen. Okay? So you have to learn and learn and learn. And when it comes time to perform, you have to completely forget about everything you learned and allow yourself to, to express yourself. So it's second nature. 
Exactly. Become second. Yeah, there's no thought at all. And that's when the real beauty happens. You know, in the past, I went to my first Schutzen seminar in 1974. So that's a long, long, long time Two ago. Two years before I was born. <laughs> but anyway, Sorry. that's sad to say. It really <laughs> bugs me. <laughs> hey, getting old, is, there's nothing nice about it. But over the years, uh, I have known several decoys, not a lot, but several that co could go out there and work dogs and they couldn't tell you what they were doing, but they could feel what they were doing. And it was kind of cool to watch them. It really is kind of cool. But with that all said, I think what we've learned is being a decoy is a learned skill. Mm -hmm. So people can learn how to do it. Oh, absolutely. And people can become good at it. People that really aren't coordinated, if they practice enough, it becomes second nature to them. I think that's where the DVDs that we've produced, you've really helped a lot. You know, uh, in the late 80s, I produced some DVDs on uh, personal protection work and suit work, and I go back and look at those today compared to what you guys are doing now, you and my son Jeff. It's like light years. It's light years away from what we did back then. Well, you know, I mean, we didn't, if you think about it, back then, the, all of us, I mean, well, you know, 89, that was, that was a while ago, but it back, you know, for me, ni let's say 99, 98, you know, there was, the internet was coming out yeah. then, but we didn't have access to the information. Mm -hmm. And now the information has become so accessible because of, because of you and those yeah. videos that we did and then what's going on now with your streaming stuff and all that stuff, that it's great, you know, you're right. Every, people, some people are better at certain things than others. Yep. I'm a terrible fisherman. I can't <laughs> set a hook to save my life. It's the reality, it's yeah. just the reality. Some people are really good at fishing, some people aren't, but it doesn't mean that you, you can't work hard and develop Absolutely. a skill. Absolutely. Because it's, it's just like anything else, we've, we've all learned how to drive cars, yep. we've all learned how to ride bicycles, all these different things, or fish, yep. or you know, run a computer. It's just learned skill and absolutely everybody can do it, you know? Well, I think I wish that I was uh, 20 years younger with everything that's going on now on the internet. I look at people and what they can learn. Mm -hmm. They can learn good and they can learn bad. I mean, you only have to go to YouTube and look at some of the stuff. There's as much good information, there's much bad information. Way as more, yeah. way more bad information than there is good information, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, it used to bother me that oh, look at this, all this stuff is being shown on, on YouTube and this and that, and it's gonna be the death of us. Well, it's really not. Mm -hmm. You know, we're starting an online course. Uh, it's coming out soon. You're gonna be part of that. That's gonna just take everything to a new level. People talk to us about, well, can I learn everything there is to learn from your DVDs? And my answer is absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. I, I tell people, that if you really want to get to the level you're at, you know, you have to start someplace. Mm -hmm. I say, get the DVDs, watch them 20 times, mm -hmm. study them. Now we're at a point though where we're going online and we're gonna be able to take that to the next level, which is somebody can put together an online course, which basically uh, will probably involve one, two, three DVDs where it's all broken down, but what it, what the online courses are going to add are the ability to interact with the instructor and ask questions mm -hmm. and, and then go out and videotape their own dogs in short segments and offer them for a critique. And then the That's, instructor can critique that person critique specifically it. Right. instead of them sitting in their living room practicing the moves, doing it incorrect. And that's, that's the next level past the DVD, but if they come to me and say, can I take your online course mm -hmm. and learn to be a dog trainer, I'm going to say no. You can't. That's the middle step, in my opinion. The third step, and probably it sh should be third or fourth, but the third step is they got to go and work hands-on with a guy like you, a guy like Michael Ellis. You know, they have to work with these high-level trainers with hands-on, and if you do that, then you can become a good dog trainer. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's going to be the evolution of this whole thing. I think it's going to be... DVDs, uh, you know, you take our website. Our website is about 16,000 pages. Yeah, we have absolutely hands down, and it's just because I started in 1994. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough that one of my best friends was uh, 
in charge of all of the computers for the university here in town. He drug me screaming and hollering into his office on a Saturday morning in October. I can remember it. It was October 20th, a day of infamy for Learburg. And we sat down and we went into, this was before Internet Explorer or Netscape or anything like that, and we went into a library in Australia and read articles on training police service dogs in Australia. And that is the future. The world became a lot smaller that day, didn't it? Unbelievable. And from that point on, I tried to find somebody to help put something together. They didn't have anything. So I got books and started to read about HTML. And for the first six years, I put it all my, together myself. Well, now we've been doing it ever since then. Nobody can catch up. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, I just got to say, it's really, it's really cool because I mean, obviously technology is really cool, but what you're doing is cool because when I, I didn't say, when I started to do this, when I decided that dogs was what I wanted to, to get into this biting thing, I started to search for a way to, to see it, not even to learn, just to be around it, to yeah. see how this stuff works. There was not, there literally was nothing. I started to talk to police departments and, and then I found out, oh no, you can't, you know, hope to be a canine handler and become a cop. You are just kind of randomly chosen or selected for whatever reason. And I, I thought, boy, there is no light at the end of this tunnel. And the cool thing is now, like if here we are, you know, 15, 16, whatever, 17 years later, uh, if, if I was in that same boat then now, I could, you know, go to, and of course, this, is, this isn't like working a dog, but I could go to Learburg. I could get the videos. I could learn and say, oh, all right, well, this, by watching the videos, this would be a logical suit for me to order. Or, okay, now I got my suit, I need to learn how to move. And by, it's like, you know, watching Richard Simmons, I hate to say it, but you do your right, <laughs> you do your lefts, you do this and you do this. And by the fourth time you watch that Richard Simmons tape, yeah. you're doing all the stuff with him. And it's basically the same thing. And if you can get in a suit and show up to the training field, and I know I work with new guys all the time. And then you put them in a suit, you give them a stick, and they look at you like a deer in the headlights. Like, yeah. what am I supposed to do now? So if you have a guy who, granted, he looks like a deer in the headlights because a, a dog is about to come and bite him for the first time, but still, he knows how to safely use a stick. He knows how to move back and forth. He understands what a, re, a counter is. He understands a rebite. He understands preparing for the out. It's just going to put him that much further ahead. And, and again, it's... It's, it's just really cool that this information is now so, so accessible. On the flip side of it, for someone in Australia, where the, as far as I know, there's no French ring, or there's no Mondial ring, or there's no real suit sports, as far as I know, and that person can now, by way of these DVDs and, and yeah, things like that, courses. learn this information. Now, you have uh, seminars. Yes. At your place. Yes. And you do private training at your place? Yes. What we'll do is we'll put... Uh, your email address and your website on here okay. so that people can find out when you're going to have seminars. Mm -hmm. They can uh, send you an email and, and I would assume you or Irina will create a list and when you have new seminars coming up, you can just send contact out a, those people. Yeah, contact them. But Cindy and I go to these seminars and they're good. Mm -hmm. So if you have an interest, if you live anywhere near, uh, you should take advantage of Mark because uh, he's a good guy. He's a really, really good dog trainer. If uh, you want a really good poodle, <laughs> don't be surprised. Someday I might be having one of your poodles at our house. Well, you'll have the or one Pressa or uh, a Malinois. They should come and talk to you. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to talk with you guys. There's, there's, no, one, there's no one person in the United States that can, salt, that can provide dogs for everybody that no. has an interest. And there's no perfect dogs either. No, there isn't. But you know what? What I try and do with everything, I guess, in life is um, A, make sure that I don't stifle those around me. Yeah. You know, with the, in terms of training, or if I'm playing in a band, I don't want to in, impose on them. I don't want to make someone uncomfortable with their dog. At the same time, I just find that uh, if you're honest with people, things just always work out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks for sitting down with oh, us. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's been it's a cool. pleasure to be here, Ed. <laughs>